Hi, I'm Amy Paller, Chair of Dermatology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, and I am a pediatric dermatologist at the Lurie Children's Hospital there. I'll be speaking with you today about pediatric atopic dermatitis and show you that children are more than just little adults. Well, as you know, atopic dermatitis is primarily a pediatric problem. About 60% present before one year and 85% by five years of age. In fact, the prevalence in children is 10 to 18% of the population. And the number has been shown to be about 7% of adults. When we think about the age, we can also see that the annual prevalence is the greatest during those first years of life. And then it goes down as children, quote unquote, outgrow their disease. Um, we can also, as I'll show you, see new ones developing at all times. When we think about the severity, about one third have moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, and especially past three years of age, the percentage with moderate to severe disease goes up in the population of children and then adults. Now we've often talked about differences between children and adults or children even in adolescence related to the morphology and the distribution of lesions. I wanna just walk through that for a little bit to remind you that infants often have a lot on their face and particularly on the cheeks and skin and chin. They also have more on their extensor surfaces rather than flexor surfaces. The trunk is often affected, but one of the key signs is that the diaper area is spared. In these young children, the um, eruption tends to be particularly exudative. And I think if you look at the image on the upper right, you can see this swollen, oozing cheek, oftentimes mistaken to be secondary infection, but is really just the tremendous edema and oozing that can occur particularly on the cheeks of infants. As we get into childhood, we see uh, a little bit less of that exudation and, and more in flexural folds. And by the time we have adolescents and adults, a lot more like canification of these excoriated plaques. And we really see the, the distribution in the flexural areas and on the wrist, the ankles, the hands and feet, when it's on the face, we're talking more about the eyelids and the peri uh, or official areas, and then a little bit more on the neck. But I will tell you that I have seen babies who have the exact distribution of adolescents, and I have seen adolescents who have a little bit more of that early age distribution. So it's not 100%. I also want to remind you that there are some different morphologies that can be seen. A more follicular pattern of the atopic dermatitis is particularly seen in African-Americans. Nomular dermatitis is seen more often in infants, for example, and younger children, uh, and often is harder. And of course, especially with more chronicity, uh, we can see more of the parigo nodularis, which of course can be a standalone problem, but not infrequently is seen in children with chronic atopic dermatitis. Now, I mentioned earlier that frequency of, of onset during infancy and, and uh, during uh, when children are toddlers. Uh, and that group often remits early as well. But then we can see some that have that early onset without remission. We can see an early onset just coming up by school age. We can see onset later in childhood, ad adolescent onset, adult onset, and even onset at more than 60 years of age. So highly heterogeneous disease course. Now, what about the differential diagnosis? And here, again, a difference when we're thinking about that in children and in infants versus in adults. So remember, immunodeficiency is something we really don't wanna miss. And atopic dermatitis may be the presenting sign. I'm showing you a bunch of pictures of babies. They all have atopic dermatitis. And I would say to you, can you look at these and tell me which ones have immunodeficiency? And that's really hard to do. This is the answer. I think you can look at the one uh, towards the bottom that's circled in pink and recognize the facies of hypohydratic ectodermal dysplasia with immunodeficiency. But some of the others might be more difficult because they don't have typical facies. For example, the two in the top and the middle with X-linked skin 
the one on the right top with Wiscott Aldridge or the one on the bottom with hyper IgE syndrome. I couldn't tell the difference, but it's really taking that good history, including the history of infections, perhaps failure to thrive and other specific signs for each disease that can clue you in and lead you to having others help with making that diagnosis or ordering some screening labs yourself. Other parts of the differential diagnosis, I must mention seborrheic dermatitis, which often coincides. And of course that early scalp seborrheic dermatitis can go away, but the atopic dermatitis may not. Uh, and, and one of the signs can be, of course, that very itchy scalp. We can see ichthyosis, particularly the more erythrodermic types, confused with atopic dermatitis. And sometimes we don't know if maybe kids have both because atopic dermatitis is so frequent, but particularly congenital ichthyosis from erythroderma and Netherton syndrome are two in which it may be hard to differentiate. Even psoriasis can look like an overlap in children. And in fact, we see children who have both atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. And then we have those who have more of a psoriasiform dermatitis, particularly when there's involvement on the face, which is more common with psoriasis in children than as you see in older individuals with about four to 5% even just having facial involvement. And often that facial involvement is not these distinct well delimited uh, plaques, but rather, um, more diffuse, so involvement of the eyelids, involvement elsewhere in the face as I'm showing you here. And of course, we can't forget scabies. Lots of times kids get secondary examination with scabies and we miss the original scabies. So gotta think about it, especially when it comes up later on, but certainly even in infants who often also have nodular disease. And then let's not forget allergic contact dermatitis in the differential. Of course, you can have atopic dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis is something that you're actually using, but we have to think about this uh, as a coinciding factor or something that can be confused. This is the picture that I got of a child whose mother was treating the eczema by trying to keep his face as clean as possible using wipes. And of course, uh, his reactivity was MCI-MI. Not as often in adult, uh, as in adults, but drug-induced dermatitis, photosensitivity disorders, uh, particularly actinic parago and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma can occur in children as well. Now, there are many impacts of pediatric atopic dermatitis. This is gonna look like something that I might show you for adults, except that here we're talking about an issue on school, school absenteeism, school productivity, more issues with stigma, bullying, and of course the psychosocial development that occurs during childhood and adolescence, such a critical time. Now you can see here, there are comorbidities we have to think about, and we're gonna hear more about other atopic diseases next, but mental health considerations are also an issue, definitely an increase in ADD, ADHD uh, in children, as well as anxiety and depression. And the impaired quality of life is not just in the children, but also the entire family. There have been very few pediatric specific guidelines for atopic dermatitis, but the news is that the AAD is currently developing specific guidelines for pediatric atopic dermatitis. So we're looking forward to seeing those. Just wanna mention two new quick ways to measure this. Many of you will be going into uh, office practice and I wanna mention that there are some highly reliable but simple measures. You might start thinking about incorporating them in. One is it's quick to get an investigator global assessment of none to severe. Uh, and if you multiply that by your estimate of body surface area, you get a relatively new scale that's been called the IGA times BSA score. And that's been shown to very strongly correlate with the easy score. So no need to go through all of that in your office, just take these, multiply them. Uh, and we're trying to develop things for uh, Epic that will allow you to easily know then mild, moderate or severe based on your assessment. But of course, we're not just all about just looking at the signs that one can see, but getting that patient input. And I just wanna mention, I really like the Syndex Mini for atopic dermatitis as a quick screening tool. Three questions, one on symptoms, one on emotions, one on function. It's been used now by more than 450 dermatologists through the American Academy of Dermatology. Autology. It's got convergent validity with the Skindex 16 in adults. And we just did a study in almost 200 children with atopic dermatitis and found that the Skindex mini, just three questions, correlates very strongly with the children's dermatology life quality index and moderately with a whole slew of other scores. Keep it in mind. 
Now, how do we treat stepwise approach? You know all about this. The good skin care and trigger avoidance early on, mild atopic dermatitis, of course, treated generally with topical corticosteroids, but relatively low strength, and we can throw in the topical uh, calcineurin inhibitors or topical phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor, uh, and just intermittently treat with then emollients between flares. It's really when we get up to moderate to severe that we start having to be challenged by how do we manage this and yet maintain safety for children. So we might treat flares more with more potent agents of topical corticosteroids and devise uh, tapering down to a milder topical corticosteroid or pulling in these various non-steroidal alternatives or even doing proactive management where we know we can't stop an anti-inflammatory medication without a flare occurring. And so for those sites that recurrently flare, we'll start with the twice daily, get it under control, go to once daily for days to a week, and then we'll go down to a maintenance of two to three times a week when clear or almost clear with a mid-strength steroid or perhaps a tacrolimus ointment and try to maintain clearance by keeping the uh, inflammation down at that particular site, even when it's looking quite good and avoiding the roller coaster of flares. Of course, there are some patients who need more than that. And then we have to think about phototherapy or a systemic immunosuppressants or more recently dupilumab. We might hospitalize for a short term. We might use wet wrap therapy, but we need to think about moving to something else. I remind you that before we do that, we have to make sure that we've done everything we can with topicals. And we need to think about, is there non-adherence? Are they just not following what we think they're following and explore ways to turn that around? We need to see if there's infection. We need to think about the misdiagnosis. We need to think about contact allergies. And we might think about referral, for example, to an allergist uh, in that small group of, of uh, particularly young children who, who just aren't responding if there's anything else we can do with management. I don't want to leave this section without mentioning what's new with topical calcineurin inhibitors and remind you that there's now a new study out showing no evidence of increased cancer incidence in children using topical tacrolimus. This is based on the at least 10-year follow-up of patients in which there were no more observed cases of malignancy than expected for that cohort. Uh, and in fact, none of the cases of malignancy were lymphoma or non-melanoma skin cancer, the ones that were the theoretical risk when the black box warning was put on uh, more than 15 years ago. There's also a new study out showing that there is no association between topical calcineurin use and keratinocyte carcinoma risk among adults with atopic dermatitis. Now, can we reverse this black box that takes our time in the office because we have to explain that the pharmacist may talk with them about this cancer risk? Uh, and the answer is people are trying to do that, but it may be difficult. Now, we're gonna talk the rest of the time about new pathogenesis, new therapies. And I just wanna remind you that these are pathogenesis based, based on the impaired barrier, based on the immune abnormalities, particularly in the Th2 pathway and the interleukin-22 that are involved in driving the atopic dermatitis. Now, what about in children? Is it different from in adults? Well, there is an evolution. This is showing the skin biomarkers that we recently published. Uh, and what I wanna point out is that there are differences. If you look at the blue TH1, we continue throughout childhood, throughout adolescence to see suppression in the TH1 pathway. We can see some variability with increases in TH17 in children compared to uh, in adults. We can see some differences versus adults with terminal differentiation or the expression of tight junctions. But what is not different from adults is what we see with the TH2 and the TH22 pathways. And therefore that increase that we see in non-lesional and to a greater extent lesional skin means that therapeutic approaches targeting type two cytoclines should work regardless of age. And of course they do. I also wanna show you that there are differences in blood. This is other work that we've done looking at infants, but also all the way up. And first that TH1 or interferon gamma deficiency in pediatric atopic dermatitis is seen here in the frequency of the T cells expressing the interferon. And that may explain some of the difficulty in handling infections. And then if you look here as well, the, the IL-13 
cells that are CD4 positive um, are certainly uh, increased, and that's regardless of age. But as we see patients getting older, we can see a spreading out of the T cells that are abnormal in atopic dermatitis. So it becomes CLA negative IL-13 expressing T cells that are increased in frequency. And then we can see uh, CD8 positive cells as well that are abnormal in atopic dermatitis with advancing age. Now the next topical agent for pediatric atopic dermatitis is going to be uh, the JAK inhibitor. So just reminding you JAK activation is downstream. What you should know is that JAK inhibitors may provide the efficacy uh, topically applied without the concerns of safety. And they have not to date been associated with burning and stinging. The first one out of the gate here in the United States will be topical ruxolitinib. It's looked great in trials. And these have included about 20% adolescents with trials now moving forward for younger children. Delgacitinib is already in Japan and in trials for children, but will only be in the United States for chronic hand eczema. A new one, reposinib, is a TIC2 JAK1 inhibitor, and it also looks promising, including in studies with adolescents. Roflumilast is a more potent PDE4 inhibitor than crisoboral, uh, and it's looking good in trials with less burning and stinging than crisoboral. And then the first therapeutic aryl hydrocarbon modulating agent, or TAMA, is Topinarov. This is an, an agonist of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor on keratinocytes. It affects the barrier, it affects the inflammation, it affects handling of microbes, and it also regulates artemin, which is an activator of TRYP-V1 and TRYP-A1, so likely affects itch as well. And these look good in trials that have included adolescents with no burning or stinging, although folliculitis has been reported. Finally, topical commensals is a new topical approach. Uh, those with strong anti-staphylococcal killing, including staph hominis, have not yet entered into pediatric trials. However, uh, there were just phase two randomized double-blind vehicle-controlled studies of the gram-negative rosiamona, uh, mu rosiamonas mucosa that just ended, and a press release showed that they had no significant effect. Managing with system immuno immunosuppressive, we talked about phototherapy, but often not tolerated in flame skin and just too difficult for many adolescents. Systemic steroids, too toxic for continued use and rebound when discontinued. So the favored immunosuppressant before dupilumab, cyclosporin A, but of course has associated infections, renal and hepatic toxicity, as well as hypertension as risks and requires lab testing. For most patients, we might start with cyclosporin and after three or four months with some good results, transition them to another less toxic immunosuppressant, our favorite being methotrexate, but these have a slow onset of action and they themselves have their own potential toxicities and require lab testing. Dupilumab, I think you know a lot about this already. These are the 16 week phase three trials with the endpoints on the left of each for the investigator global assessment on the right of each with the easy 75. And whether we're talking on the left about the adolescent studies, which by the way, were monotherapy, or we're talking on the right about the uh, studies with TCS, which of course have somewhat better results because they're also topical corticosteroids. We can see the clear separation in all of these from the placebo treated, and not a lot of separation between the various dosing regimens that were used. Nevertheless, the best one for the adolescents came out to be weight-based every two-week dosing with 200 milligrams less than 60 kilos and 300 milligrams greater than or equal to 60 kilos. For the younger children, it was uh, depending on weight base again, but for those under 30 kilos, 300 milligrams every four weeks was preferred, which is great because that means less shots, 200 milligrams every two weeks for those 30 kilograms and above. No surprises with respect to adverse events, same as adults, injection site reactions and conjunctivitis, and the same reduction in skin infections. I will tell you that the PK studies have shown a wide range of safety in children. And now six months to five-year-old children still in trials, not yet on the market, but able to go to even higher doses than were originally thought just because of that wide range of safety. 
I'm going to just show you some practical considerations, but we really don't have time to go through these. So take a look, um, just reminding you it's also proof for asthma, the idea of doing live immunizations before starting, the need to transition if on another systemic therapy, don't just stop cold, continue the topical corticosteroids till you get to the point that they're good enough to start tapering them and go for a good four months as a trial, although we can usually tell by two months. I've boosted the dose of frequency if I can get it for those who are partial responders, about 50% of them have responded and keep patients on it for a while. It can improve their quality of life and we need some stability with that. But after a year or two, if they wanna to try to see what happens without it, make sure you taper slowly and only consider stopping if they truly are clear. The beauty is that there's no lab testing needed. There's a transient increase in eosinophils, but it's not consequential. I like the pen form for the older children who want to do it themselves. And we can pre-treat with topical anesthetic, but we have to recognize that for some of these younger children, their fear of shots is so great that it's just too traumatic. The parents can't handle it. It's horrible if they come in the office to get the shot every four weeks and we just can't go this route. Consider eye drops in the first month to reduce the conjunctivitis and treat periorbital dermatitis with something like topical tacrolimus because they often have that in association with the conjunctivitis and a little bit can get into the eye perhaps and helps with that. And finally, the red face, the psoriasis reactions, the alopecia areata that occur during the course that have been described in adults are rare, but they've also been described in children. The emerging biologics are their IL-13 inhibitors, nemalizumab, the IL-31 receptor inhibitor, and these are all moving forward in trials, but not yet approved in pediatrics. Finally, the JAK inhibitors. Um, I think that it's really fabulous that they have a rapid and strong effect on itch. Perhaps that includes this IL-31 effect. They're oral agents that can be taken once daily and rapidly cleared so they can easily be stopped and started, which means they may be the choice for seasonal or intermittent for flares if they're affordable. They may even be the first choice for the most severe and those with alopecia areata because you get a double hit there. We have two that are JAK1 selective that will be coming out soon. They've shown high efficacy in adolescents, which were combined in adult trials, although there was one specific trial for teens with abrocitinib, and these are moving forward now in younger children. There is citinib appearing a little less efficacious, a little bit more of that JAK2 effect currently in trials for adolescents. The big problem with the JAK inhibitors is all about safety, and that is typically a deciding factor for parents there will be a black box warning. There will be lab monitoring required. There are potential risks that we're not seeing with the injectables like nausea, headache, acne, an increased risk of herpes zoster and herpes simplex and some lab abnormalities that can be seen, although hopefully not limiting. We don't know if there are gonna be differences in the side effect profile among the JAK inhibitors, including in children but what we do know is right now, there is no signal of malignancy, thromboembolism, or high-risk infections in the atopic dermatitis trials. But will a signal emerge, including when these do come on the market and we're treating larger numbers, how much will the recent issues with tocotinib, especially cardiovascular, affect the desire to use these? I think this is something we're going to have to see, but there's no question there will be concerns about their use in children. So with that, I want to just show you um, a, a, a study from Silverberg et al. suggesting that there's actually greater efficacy um, against uh, as, when pitted with dupilumab. And there have been head-to-head -head trials. Uh, Patacitinib looks a little bit, um, and, and abrocitinib both looking a little bit better um, than dupilumab in the head-to-head -head trials uh, with dupilumab coming in about where the lower dosing is. Patacitinib, not in head-to-head, -head, but in some of these systematic reviews, does appear to be even a little bit stronger than the abrocitinib. So in conclusion, atopic dermatitis in children is different from in adults, but both are characterized by the TH2, TH22 skewing, and both need safe, effective medication. Having that more targeted and safer therapy does not even require blood monitoring. And I think that's lowering the bar then for us to consider systemic treatment for moderate to severe pediatric atopic dermatitis. And as a father recently described when he came in, this has been a game changer in improving life quality. 
One question is, will biomarkers, especially those perhaps obtained non-invasively by tape stripping, help us to predict the course and response to systemic medications in the future? And also, will earlier initiation in severe disease, including during infancy, reduce the risk of later developing uh, allergic and neuropsychiatric comorbidities? And with that, I thank you for your attention.